Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's presentation. Our presenter is Shannon Bull, MLIS, CDS, FRAS, and HIP. Uh, she's working toward a degree at John Hopkins University, and she's the owner president of Arcopedia. As her avatar, Archivist Llewellyn, Shannon was a finalist for the Linden Prize in 2010 for her creation of the Neil A. Armstrong Library and Archives in Second Life in collaboration with NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Caltech. I don't know if you've had a chance to visit that, but I visited it at the time and it was just amazing. In 2011, she won second place in an international competition in artificial intelligence for her second life-based project, Curiosity AI. She has been an invited speaker at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Her current second life endeavor, Project Plutik, was selected as one of the most innovative new digital technologies for medical libraries by the Medical Library Association in 2018 and is featured in the October issue of the Journal of the Medical Library Association. Her company is collaborating with the University of Michigan Ann Arbor to design an interface for a mobile app version. By now we've all read the description of tonight's presentation, which is why I assume we're here. So let's get right to the presentation to hear the AI bot professor librarian deliver a lecture to combat fake news. Archivist Llewellyn, it's all yours. Hey, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, I would like to just say a few words before um, we get started with the bots lecture. And that is, I handed out a note card, and everyone should have a copy of that. Um, it has a link to the full text uh, article that appears in the Medical Library Association. So if you'd like to uh, take a look at that when you get a chance after the presentation, um, feel free to read that. And it puts the project in context of uh, where the objectives are, where I'm heading with this project down the road. Um, and for right now, the project is located in Second Life, and I've done a lot of my AI research in Second Life. But it is eventually going to be headed towards the 2D web in the form of an app. And the app is going to be designed uh, for doctors, medical doctors, to use. And there's going to be um, not only some of the elements that you're seeing developed here in Second Life, but also some new elements involving machine learning, um, things like um, analyzing medical images, as well as um, being able to read and analyze genomic sequencing. So um, those are some of the medical library elements that um, I'm working towards. Some of it you can see here in Second Life. Some of it is not yet available in Second Life and may only be available through the app itself. The app is going to be intended to be a, um, it's not an open source project. Um, essentially, my company is funding this entire project and paying a number of people to um, work with me to assist me um, in the development of Project Kluchik. So um, just recently, uh, I've spoke with a person. I'm trying to get a couple people on board. One person is an expert in PhD, expert in um, basically computational genomics. And another person has a background in Latin and Greek. Um, and they may be helping to add to the dictionary of uh, Pluchik to provide additional medical definitions uh, that are unique, um, that are not just simply cited from websites. The, um, the goal kind of, of the chatbot version of Pluchik is to function sort of like Siri, um, if, you've, if you've used that, or Google Home, asking you questions, and then it responds in voice. So. Um, in Second Life, I'm combining that chatbot using voice with um, a 3D element in order to perform uh, the same kinds of things you might as a person giving a lecture. And there's no better way for me to demonstrate the bot than to actually have the bot give a lecture itself. So before I get started, um, I wanted to mention a couple of things about um, the lecture. It is fully automated. Um, basically, I just tell the bot to start to say start presentation, 
and the bot starts the presentation and runs straight through. So if we get knocked off for any reason, uh, rolling restarts or whatever, uh, we have to restart from the beginning. So that's, that's, that's a drawback of that. But um, normally we haven't had any problems with it so far, knock on wood. Um, if you don't already have um, your sound enabled where you can hear, um, you should do that now. <laughs> Hopefully you did because otherwise you won't be able to hear me speaking. Um, and then the other thing is, is that when the, the bot plays the video, which is all automatic, um, then what you would like to do, I, I think, would be to, um, to have, um, to have the, um, you can zoom in on that whiteboard that has the YouTube, um, playing. You can, uh, click on the button to make it larger so it fills up the full screen. And then the only thing the bot can't do is stop the video, and that's because YouTube has that auto forward feature. So you're going to have to manually stop the video from playing on your end. Um, I just like to ask too that um, you um, have your your voice turned off during the conversation today. Um, I'm working on uh, adding in voice recognition technology, but right now, uh, today, what's available is the text-to-speech technology that's been integrated uh, into the bot, into Second Blood. So as far as I know, um, this is the first bot to uh, deliver a fully automated lecture. It's also one of the only, um, I think there's maybe one other one out there, uh, bot that can uh, use voice technology and integrate that into Second Life. So um, uh, hopefully we can get started here. Are there any questions before the bot goes um, about the presentation or getting ready for the presentation? We'll have a question and answer session at the end where you can ask more detailed questions. But any questions before we get started? Okay, it doesn't look that way. So hopefully we can just um, give, what I'll do is um, when I'm talking to the bot, I have to uh, say the bot's name and please spell the bot's name correctly. Um, <laughs> it's kind of uh, got an unusual name, Pluchik, which is named after a psychi psychologist. Um, so what I, all I do is I tell Pluchik to start the presentation in local start chat. presentation. And then the bot acknowledges that it's starting its presentation. Hello, my name is Pluchik. I am pleased to be here with you today. Seeing the right way. I hope you are all as excited as I am. Today I'll be talking about astronauts and DNA of car presence. If you have never been to a fully automated lecture by an artificial intelligence bot, please note that the talk is scripted and that I am changing the slides. I believe I am the only embodied AI bot in Second Life that can talk in voice and give fully automated lectures to date. I can also respond in real time as a chatbot when you type my name. However, to avoid interruption of this talk, when talking about me in chat, please say the bot and not my name. There will be time at the end of the talk to chat with me directly, to see my ability to research medical and biomedical information, and to ask me questions. This past year NASA astronauts Mark Kelly and Scott Kelly, who are twins, participated in a unique research experiment called the Twin Study examining the genetic implications of space exploration that made headlines around the world. This included an error in reporting the findings. Notice the NASA patch that includes the International Space Station as the letter W in the word twins. Do you think NASA would produce fake news?
After you have examined the story's background you will be asked to debate if the situation was indeed the purposeful presentation by NASA of fake news to grab headlines, or something else. Perhaps it could be an unintentional mistake due to misinterpretation by NASA science communicators about DNA research when they wrote the press release? Beyond NASA's walls, can blame also be assigned? Consider, for example, the failure of fact-checking by major news agencies. What about poor science education on the part of Americans who did not know the difference? As technology advances, perhaps at least part of the blame for reading by the public of fake news has to do with failure of technological advancements to help identify and remove fake news before we read it. This short presentation will briefly explore the trustworthiness of bioinformatics data. This includes the current and future use of AI in automated search and retrieval of bioinformatics data and other materials within the arena of medical librarianship. I will explore the various elements of the preliminary report issued by NASA for its twin study, including both the incorrect and correct science that was reported. Let's begin with NASA's first effort to sequence DNA in January 2016. They used a special miniature, handheld DNA sequencing unit, about the size of a television remote control unit, called the MinION. This experiment occurred during airborne parabolic maneuvers to simulate microgravity. As a first step toward sequencing in space and aboard the International Space Station, we tested the Oxford Nanopore Technologies MinION during a parabolic flight to understand the effects of variable gravity on the instrument and data. In a successful proof-of-principle experiment, we found that the instrument generated DNA reads over the course of the flight, including the first ever sequenced in microgravity. Let's take a moment to watch a video of this experiment. Please look at the whiteboard to the right of the PowerPoint display. If the video does not play automatically, please press the play arrow. For best viewing, click full screen. When the video concludes, stop the video. HTTPS colon slash slash U2.B slash J again 9 Y muta. Rel equals zero. According to an article published in The Atlantic, How Did Astronaut DNA Become Fake News? What the NASA study stated was that some of Scott's genes changed their expression while he was in space. They also said 7% of those genes did not return to their pre-flight states months after he came back to Earth. If 7% of Scott's genetic code changed, he would have come back an entirely different species. Well, surely that is not right. The source of two problems appears to be a press release from NASA called Twin Study Confirms Preliminary Findings. The initial release referenced something called a space gene. Well, as it turns out there is no such thing as a space gene. Researcher Christopher Mason admitted inventing the term, despite the fact that he is a geneticist and knows better. Apparently he thought the phrase would catch on with the public, and no doubt the media. The release also said that 93% of genes belonging to Scott Kelly reverted to pre-flight conditions after he returned to Earth, but that 7% did not. The absurdity of the mistake is enough to make one wonder if someone in the universe is out there laughing at us, which seems to be the case. The NASA Hubble telescope caught a space image that certainly looks like it. In part because NASA is usually a trustworthy organization, the major media outlets ran with their press release. Therefore, the widespread dissemination of the information may have graduated it from a small mistake to fake news. As an example, NBC, along with many other major national news agencies, did not fact-check the story and got the facts wrong. It was 7% of his gene expression that did not return to normal, not 7% of his genes. How could such a glaring mistake been overlooked? First, NASA has only been sequencing genes since 2016. Well, that is not really an excuse considering the caliber of people working there. But it may explain how its press officers did not catch it. Second, the general public and the press members were educated enough to know what a gene is but were not educated enough to know what gene expression is. 
If they had, it would have been corrected before reaching the public through national news. NASA astronaut, Scott Kelly, whose DNA changes are discussed, had read about the research findings in Newsweek. NASA astronauts often have either a doctorate in science or an MD or are former fighter pilots. Scott Kelly was a fighter pilot, so it was not terribly surprising that he did not have the science background to realize the genomics mistake himself. Plus, by this time, he had already retired from NASA, and may have been somewhat out of the loop when it came to news. Unfortunately, Scott Kelly believed the error-ridden article the way it was written, and then made a post about it on Twitter. It was then liked by 13,000 people and retweeted by 4,200 people. While fake news temporarily draws attention to itself, when it undermines the purpose of an organization's mission and objectives, it can actually cost the organization its credibility. When it comes to misinformation about science, an organization like NASA with an entire arm dedicated to science education for the American public, even a small mistake that goes left unchecked for very long, cannot be excused. The press release in this case was issued in January and not corrected until March of 2018. So what is the real science NASA is hoping to achieve? The major objective, of course, was to sequence the genome of two identical twins to see what effects life in space might have on their DNA. To this end, both Scott Kelly in space and his brother on Earth had their whole genome sequenced, presumably before and after space flight, to compare their differences. A variety of changes were studied to see what effects space has on humans. For this project, there are several principal investigator, or PI, researchers who have extensive backgrounds leading teams researching a specific question. Areas of research for the twin study include human biochemistry, DNA and RNA sequences, proteome, and telomeres. Small changes can affect the larger functionality of the body, including the human epigenome, immunome, metabolome, microbiome, and cognition. As an example, Andrew Feinberg, MD, works at Johns Hopkins examining how epigenetics causes diseases like cancer, accelerated aging, and neuropsychiatric illness. His research topic is probably the closest to medical problems astronauts faced since Project Mercury. These medical problems have included elevated exposure to cancer causing radiation, rapid bone loss similar to osteoporosis, and stress-induced psychological conditions like close confinement of extended duration like on the ISS. The pillars of creation represent a unique example of radiation in nebulae, where stars are born. Radiation in space is different than on Earth, especially solar particles and galactic cosmic rays. The Earth's magnetic fields and its atmosphere protects us from these. Once they leave Earth, astronauts are exposed to these types of radiation in space. The long-term effects on human DNA, however, is not yet fully understood. Epigenetics and epigenomics are fields that seek to understand how the environment affects DNA. Environmental variables like exposure to high radiation levels can change the chemical compounds necessary to bind to the genes that regulate protein production. Damage to these switches with the instructions that turn on or off the functions of genes in our genome can result in serious health problems like cancer. Preventing damage to the epigenome on long missions to Mars and beyond is a central research question in this project. Res P53 
Tumor suppressor proteins like p53 help the body fight cancer. One way to compare genomics and epigenomics is to make an analogy of a busy workplace where the genome constitutes a group of busy workers, or laborers, and the epigenome consists of the supervisors, or managers. This supervisory group is composed of methyl groups and histones that give directions. The directions can either be blunt, binary directions, do or do not do, or they can be subtle gradations of instruction. Methyl groups are blunt. Think of them as a switch that binds to a gene and says express this gene or do not express this gene. Histones are subtle. They act like a dial, turning up or down how much the gene will express itself. If the DNA winds tightly around the histones, it will express less. If DNA winds loosely around the histones it will express more. Every cell is unique with its own methylation and histone pattern. Both genomes and epigenomes contain information that is unique and can either be hereditary or can change through life. Even with identical twins, due to the changes in epigenomes, they will never be entirely identical later in life. Let us watch a short video that explains this process in greater detail. Dures P53 HTTPS colon slash slash U2 dot B slash underscore AHNJMVHC This is crazy. Never seen anything like this. Here's a conundrum. Identical twins originate from the same DNA, so how can they turn out so different, even in traits that have a significant genetic component? For instance, why might one twin get heart disease at 55 while her sister runs marathons in perfect health? Nature versus nurture has a lot to do with it, but a deeper related answer can be found within something called epigenetics. That's the study of how DNA interacts with a multitude of smaller molecules found within cells, which can activate and deactivate genes. If you think of DNA as a recipe book, those molecules are largely what determine what gets cooked, when. They aren't making any conscious choices themselves. Rather, their presence and concentration within cells makes the difference. So how does that work? Genes in DNA are expressed when they're read and transcribed into RNA, which is translated into proteins by structures called ribosomes. And proteins are much of what determines a cell's characteristics and function. Epigenetic changes can boost or interfere with the transcription of specific genes. The most common way interference happens is that DNA, or the proteins it's wrapped around, gets labeled with small chemical tags. The set of all of the chemical tags that are attached to the genome of a given cell is called the epigenome. Some of these, like a methyl group, inhibit gene expression by derailing the cellular transcription machinery or causing the DNA to coil more tightly, making it inaccessible. The gene is still there, but it's silent. Boosting transcription is essentially the opposite. Some chemical tags will unwind the DNA, making it easier to transcribe, which ramps up production of the associated protein. Epigenetic changes can survive cell division, which means that they could affect an organism for its entire life. Sometimes that's a good thing. Epigenetic changes are part of normal development. The cells in an embryo start with one master genome. As the cells divide, some genes are activated and others inhibited. Over time, through this epigenetic reprogramming, some cells develop into heart cells and others into liver cells. Each of the approximately 200 cell types in your body has essentially the same genome, but its own distinct epigenome. The epigenome also mediates a lifelong dialogue between genes and the environment. The chemical tags that turn genes on and off can be influenced by factors including diet, chemical exposure, and medication. The resulting epigenetic changes can eventually lead to disease if, for example, they turn off a gene that makes a tumor-suppressing protein. Environmentally induced epigenetic changes are part of the reason why genetically identical twins can grow up to have very different lives. As twins get older, their epigenomes diverge, affecting the way they age and their susceptibility to disease. 
even social experiences can cause epigenetic changes. In one famous experiment, when mother rats weren't attentive enough to their pups, genes in the babies that helped them manage stress were methylated and turned off. And it might not stop with that generation. Most epigenetic marks are erased when egg and sperm cells are formed. But now, researchers think that some of those imprints survive, passing those epigenetic traits on to the next generation. Your mother's or your father's experiences as a child or choices as adults could actually shape your own epigenome. But even though epigenetic changes are sticky, they're not necessarily permanent. A balanced lifestyle that includes a healthy diet, exercise, and avoiding exposure to contaminants may in the long run create a healthy epigenome. It's an exciting time to be studying this. Scientists are just beginning to understand how epigenetics could explain mechanisms of human development and aging, as well as the origins of cancer, heart disease, mental illness, addiction, and many other conditions. Meanwhile, new genome editing techniques are making it much easier to identify which epigenetic changes really matter for health and disease. Once we understand how our epigenome influences us, we might be able to influence it, too. Be right back. And welcome to Amplify Airlines, where we offer premium PCR products. Here is the fellow that proposed the concept of the space gene. According to Dr. Christopher Mason, the most important part of this work is that it can lay the foundation for a better understanding of the risk factors to all future astronauts. It is helping today to provide what he calls a roadmap for how to avoid or address these risks on missions to Mars and beyond. One plan for our journey to Mars includes the construction of a Mars orbiting science laboratory and habitat, similar to the ISS that orbits around the Earth. Telomeres are the protective caps on the ends of chromosomes. Telomeres are longer in young people. They shorten with age. After Scott spent over a year in space, his telomeres lengthened compared to those of his brother but then shortened again after he returned home. Research by Susan Bailey may help explain why this occurred. In conclusion, I discussed several possible reasons to explain fake news that emanated from a usually trustworthy source of information, NASA. The example shows that no organization is infallible and that they need to do more to prevent unintentional errors from blooming into fake news. A few key takeaways should be that as a goal we need to take steps to ensure that science communication remains true to science facts. We need to improve science education in America so that editors as well as the general public can spot errors and prevent being misled through the use of their own knowledge and sound judgment. We need to create tools that can spot and flag fake news to be removed from the internet and to ensure that retractions are printed when needed. Additional tools could also be created like an automated reading companion to seamlessly research complex information by integrating reliable resources into web browsers and mobile apps. Readers might then be able to quickly and easily check facts and definitions when complex ideas and unfamiliar terms are being described to them. Additionally, publications aimed at popular audiences are often oversimplified. Therefore, they might also benefit from guided direction to academic papers for additional insights and detailed explanations. To that end, Ask Plutchik is going to eventually evolve into a mobile web app following its development in Second Life. What other ideas can you come up with to help prevent fake news? Please write your answer in local chat. Thank you so much for attending.
Thank you very much. This was I hope amazing. you have enjoyed this car presentation. In the remaining time, you can have a Q&A with me about medical and biomedical information. Well, I think it was, um, so the question is, was, was there any response from Scott Kelly when the mistake was finally caught? And um, I think NASA pretty much tried to downplay it a little bit in terms of um, how they handled it because um, Scott, Scott Kelly and, uh, was retired when the information came out. So, the, um, so he didn't really have an official statement from NASA, but um, on his Twitter feed, he, he posted some information that, that wasn't correct. Um, and he was just basically repeating what NASA had said. So he believed what NASA posted, just like everyone else did. And, um, you know, I think that was a little bit embarrassing, um, but it was likely embarrassing for all the media outlets as well. So um, I don't think he has anything to be, um, um, you know, ashamed of or anything like that because um, he, um, you know, he fell into the same sort of trap that we all can, and this is one of the reasons why it's so important for um, fake news um, to uh, not be cluttering up um, when people uh, up the internet when people are trying to, you know, get the real information. Um, exactly, it's not always malicious. Sometimes it can just be a mistake, especially when you're trying to convey science information. Um, when you're trying to translate complex ideas and principles and research, um, sometimes uh, a little bit can get lost in the translation when you're trying to simplify it a little bit uh, for the general public. Um, the general public generally is not going to be able to understand scientific journal articles, um, as many as there are out there in all different sorts of disciplines. There's all kinds of jargon built into them. There are some really complex ideas where the authors of those papers assume a level of background understanding that their readers will have that the general public does not have. And so I think part of what happened here was that in trying to translate um, the scientific studies, um, the person who was working in the science communication putting together the press release, if you could, because if you actually look at the press release, there was an, uh, the mistake was there. <laughs> um, and so uh, unless you actually looked at the studies themselves, it was difficult um, to be able to discern uh, what error was happening. But the other part of it was that anyone who had a, a, a very good understanding of the genome knew that that much change in the DNA, it was just not possible. So that should have sort of raised some alarm bells. But the part of the problem is that the public doesn't necessarily have the level of, of science understanding that it should have. It really underscores the importance of science communicators in conveying the basic science principles necessary. Um, who, is, who is responsible for exposing the mistake? Well, there were a number of, of articles that came out afterwards that talked about, um, you know, how uh, it was essentially a mistake and fake news. And so I don't know which one was actually first that came out, but um, there were several people who caught it that were in science, and they said, <laughs> "Hey, wait a minute! This isn't this this is not possible. I think you've made a mistake here," and uh, pointed it out. Um, so it's sort of like after the fact um, that you know, if you see a, a science-based movie, for example, a sci-fi movie, you have these people coming forward saying, "Hey, the science wasn't right in that movie, and here's where they made a mistake." It was sort of the same type of thing where. Um, after the information went public and widely public, um, there were a few people that said, uh, wait a minute, I caught this little error that you made here, and it's really a kind of important error because, um, you know, people really don't understand what the epigenome is. They understand sort of what the genome is and that each person's genome is unique, but there are still people out there who think that twins are exactly the same, down to their... Um, you know, every, you know, marker in their genome, and that's just not the case. So the one, the second video that was played um, explained how twins are not exactly alike. Um, from the moment they're born, they, they start to deviate from one another, and they're not genetically entirely identical. So, um, 
So that was another problem, actually, that was sort of perpetuated, that, that myth that, um, that twins are exactly the same. You had one twin in space and one on the ground, and they're exactly the same in terms of their genes. And so any, any changes that would occur that, you know, that would be different from one another, you would say, oh, well, you know, that was accountable because they went in space. Well, that wasn't true because um, the, the twins are different. What they, what they do is they did a, a sequencing. Uh, if you do a sequencing beforehand and then a sequencing after, you can see in that individual how their genomes have changed or not changed. Um, and twin studies are as close as we can get to trying to replicate an experiment in people. Um, and twin studies have been very popular for that reason. But um, essentially, um, I think one of the main gist of what you should learn from this experiment is that nobody's exactly like, we're all wonderfully unique. <laughs> and our genomes are all different. They're, they're like fingerprints. And even if you're a twin, you're not going to have exactly the same genome. Um, th there was EPS colon slash slash www.ncb.nln.nih.gov slash site slash entry. CMD equals search and AMP. DB equals PubMed and AMP. Term equals ACNE. Clinicaltrials.gov results. HTTPS colon slash slash clinicaltrials.gov slash CT2 slash results. Term equals ACNE. WebMD results, http colon slash slash www.webm.com slash search slash two slash results, query equals acne. So as you can see, she can do general searches where she's pulling things from many different databases that are curated by the librarian. Um, and you can just ask her in natural language to search the medical resources. So you have to say, the bot's name, and then you have to kind of give the command of search medical resources for, and then star, whatever that is, and then that, that format will always come up. Um, but you can always always uh, specify what database it is that you'd like her to research um, within the NLM suite of databases. And so, um, so you could have her search it by either the keyword of the um, condition, or you could have her search it by even the ICD-10 code. So if, for those of you who may have done some librarianship work um, in a medical library, or even done some uh, work in a doctor's office, you may know that the ICD-10 codes um, are the codes that are for billing. So what they do is they have, um, they enter in once a patient has been diagnosed with a specific condition, they enter that um, billing code um, and that diagnostic code into the computer associating that code with the patient and their condition. And so um, one of the elements of the app is going to be take what doctors are familiar with, um, whether it's just the word like diabetes or, um, or even the, the code for, for that condition, and they can just ask the bot to, to search. Uh, for medical resources on that. Um, the other thing is in Second Life, I have it set up so um, you can, um, if you type in Fluchik search uh, and then the name of the NCBI database um, for and then the star, whatever that is, so Fluchik search GTR for breast cancer, for example. Let's try that one. Um, let me type that in there. HTTPS oh, <laughs> colon slash slash www.ncb.nlm.nih.gov slash gtr slash all slash question mark term equals breast cancer. So then you can see how um, one of the key functions of the board, the interactive board, is that it listens to her URLs, it listens to um, it listens to URLs that are videos. That's how she's playing the videos. So the board is actually doing some of the work here where it just listens to the bot and no one else. And it listens for that link. And then it pull, either pulls up a web page or pulls up a YouTube video. And so that's how she's able to control the YouTube videos. Um, is there any other questions about like how she's doing what she's doing?
Yeah, she's con she controlled the board the whole time. I didn't do anything. I just I all I did was I said, "Flu chick, say start presentation," and then that board, both boards actually listen to her when she talks. And so when when she says start presentation, um, then the um, that's when the board starts. Who programmed her to do that? Um, well, the programming it's complicated. Um, there's to choosing the websites or videos. That's actually um, well. The okay. So the question is. Let me repeat the question. This is being recorded. Um, the question is. Um, who programmed her to do that in terms of choosing the websites or videos? Is it all in an in scripting language? So let's forget that she can talk in voice for a minute, okay? Because that's very different. Um, so in terms of just operating the boards, that is Linux scripting language. And there, there's a part of the code that says to listen to just her by her name or ID number, right? Her, her um, avatar ID. You know, you can you can program you can write scripts where the script object only listens to a particular person. So, like when you are making the display boards, when you have most of you have done some sort of PowerPoint presentation in Second Life, I would imagine. And um, in if you look in that script, um, it basically you know how you lock other people out is basically you just have the the, the board only listen to the owner, for example, or you only listen to a list of names. And it's literally like the name in quotes, comma, the next name in quotes, comma, in the script itself. So it's listening to just, you know, whoever you want it to listen to. It can listen to me. It can listen to you. Um, it could listen to the bot um, because the bot is an actual avatar. So um, that's how it controls who it's listening to. So if you try to type in... <laughs> yeah, you try to type in um, information. Um, you know, it's not going to so. So, um, <laughs> wonderful. So Val, librarian, is saying she's going to be in touch with Pluchik about uh, working as a reference librarian, and we we have talked a little bit about um, Pluchik um, doing some hours um, at Community Virtual Library. So Pluchik um, is programmed to do some searching on databases. She's also just a general chat bot. She can also do some personal assistant type things, like you can ask her what the weather is for your zip code. Like you could just type in weather and then your zip code. I'll just put mine in. You can try your own if you want. And then it um, works. Oh, yeah, I forgot Pluchik. <laughs> I make all the mistakes I tell people not to make. Um, there you Here's go. the forecast from weather.com http colon slash slash www.weather.com slash weather slash today slash 45805 today. Let's get back to that later. <laughs> Yes, she's very fast. Um, so essentially, um, what's happening is I used to have, when I did the other project, Curiosity AI, I ran that off my desktop, and no one could understand like what I was talking about running it off my desktop. But um, I moved everything up into Amazon uh, Web Server. So she's actually on Amazon, and um, and you know I have to log her in from the from the cloud basically, and then she can stay logged in twenty four seven, which was one of the reasons I wanted to move her to the cloud, so that I didn't have to have my machine running all the time with the with her on it and tying up my resources. So um, so she's running on uh, in the cloud, and um, so the fundamental you know chatting element that she has, she uses um, AIML, which is artificial intelligence markup language. And it's AIML is a lot like XML or HTML if you've used those. It use it has some very simple tags, and in fact, I have on my uh, my SlideShare. I did a talk on basic AIML. You could even look that up on SlideShare, and um, it provides a fundamental tutorial about how to get started with AIML. And you can see, looking at it, it's very much like HTML with the tags and markup language. Um, and so I, you know, you can start with some basic ones like Eliza. Eliza is a chatbot that runs on uh, using AML, but this is a very customized bot. It is not just simply the Eliza bot. 
So it uses AIML, which is the same language as ELISA, but it is not the same bot. Um, and in fact, um, the bot can do a lot of other things in terms of moving and gestures and following people around and all kinds of things like this. So um, is there code open for anyone to look at? Uh, no, it is not. <laughs> So again, this is like a proprietary type project. Um, and the idea is that when we're using, um, you know, and specifically when I'm using the, the codes that are the ICD-10 codes, um, there's some rules regarding UMLS so that you can't export it outside the country. So um, that's one of the reasons I can't really just let her go in Second Life and have her unobserved as long as that file is in there that has the entire list of codes. Um, that's not supposed to be just open for anyone, but you'd have to give her like 36,000 queries to get the whole thing. <laughs> so there's a lot. Um, yes, that's correct, Marie. That's because of the export rules. So that's one reason I can't just let her be in Second Life unobserved. But um, so <laughs> the um, the other element of it is the fact that when she um, when she does her searching and she does um, her chatbots um, chatbot element, um, she is doing so in in natural language and that uses the AML. But um, in order for me to provide the kinds of I don't know what you want to call it um, back end database with all the content. You know, if you look at Siri and you look at Google Home, like for example, uh, Google Assistant, which is what runs the Google Home, um, they use the Google search results. So what I end up having to do in creating all these customized things is I have to make AML files that are very, very, very long. So I'm like, there's no way I want to enter in all these these um, individual AML lines by hand. So um, so I developed a novel way to create enormous AML files that I've never seen anyone do before. Um, and I can go ahead and give you a link to that and it'll show you sort of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, I'll give that link to you there. Um, and you can watch it at your leisure. Maybe it's playing because I think I told that thing to listen to me. There we go. HTTPS uh, it, it, it slash is listening to me here. But, um, you don't have to watch it now. Um, but equals breast cancer. Uh, I don't know if it's playing or not. Um, but it's um, it's playing. Um, but it's playing. In the video, it shows specifically how I set it up, in which which is I created a an Excel spreadsheet, and like one of the um, one of the spreadsheets alone had like seventy six thousand lines of of information, um, and <laughs> um, when I try to implement a lot of this data, it's it's very time consuming, and so if I want to have De re references to definitions, for example, I can either do like what, what Google does and say, okay, well, this information came from WebMD. So according to WebMD, and then it cites, you know, a sentence or so out of WebMD, uh, or it cites Wikipedia, you know, or some unauthorized, you know, source that we would, as librarians, might not ever cite. So how that works is they just use the top result. Whatever the top result is, it just takes a blurb from that. Now, you know, I'm not, that's not what I'm doing. I'm like literally coding in all of the, all of the information. Now, when it comes to chatting, she can have some interesting chats. So, um, let me show, um, let's see here. Let's see if I can find one from the video. I'll just use one that's easy to remember. Um, it can, like she can do definitions. Um, Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> I I almost hit the limit of her Excel. Yeah, it's um, it's a lot of lines. So let's see here. Um, get her to search one that's code number. Mm -hmm. 
I don't have all the code numbers memorized, so I'm trying to cheat a little bit with the video. C7981. Okay. So. You really need to kind of know what these genes are. What, um, oh, I spelled their name wrong. <laughs> <Did this again? laughs> That's why exactly what I tell people. Don't spell their name wrong, and then I can do it. There is no need to apologize. All. Adios. You are quite welcome. I hear you dot your purpose is the wonderful presentation, Shannon and. <laughs> Sorry. HTTPS colon slash slash www.ncb.nlm.nih.gov slash gene slash question mark term equals secondary malignant neoplasm of breast. So that's an example of how she can search using those ICD-10 codes. Um, she can also define terms like blue chick. What is diabetes? You can pick your own. Are we still talking about something? I think I used the tip thing to define. According to the Genome website, diabetes is a disease characterized by an inability to make or use the hormone insulin. Insulin is needed by cells to metabolize glucose, the body's main source of chemical energy. Type I diabetes, also called insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, is usually caused by an autoimmune destruction of insulin-producing cells. Type 2 diabetes, also called non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, occurs when cells become resistant to the effects of insulin. So that was an example where she's drawing something from genome.gov, which was an approved source that I included. And it has some, it has a nice, really nice uh, definitions in there um, that are in the public domain because it's a government website. So um, you have to be really careful about copyright. So um, <laughs> that's one other thing with chatbots is, you know, how much information is, is she using and where is it coming from? What's the quality of this, the information? And then how is she, you know, still uh, working within copyright? And in terms of that, there's, you know, there's a, there's a percentage rule where you can take a certain percentage, supposedly, of a work and use that, and it's considered fair use. Um, but even that is kind of iffy these days. Um, the recent legislation has sort of um, sided on the, on the part of the copyright holder more so than on the people trying to use the information. So um, that's one of the reasons why I'm trying to hire someone who as a background in Latin and, and, um, and Greek who can, you know, interpret, you know, the foundations of these words, the etymology of, of the words, um, and can read a, a variety of selected resources that I give them to look at and then create their own unique definition um, that they're being paid to, paid to create. Um, no, I don't think there are any. Good about showing where the info came from, but he or she was just wondering is good about showing where the info came from, but he or she was just wondering. Um, yeah, she, right now she's just repeating you because <laughs> you're saying your name. Um, is there any um, plans for Pluchik citing sources like formatting citations into APA, etc.? Um, well, when Pluchik, Pluchik's designed to like sort of work in natural language. So if you look at that definition, that she provided above for um, diabetes. It just says, according to the genome website. Um, so it does sort of cite a source, and that's actually what um, Google Assistant does. And I actually have Google Assistant at home, <laughs> and I kind of use it to um, uh, serve as a benchmark. You know, I can, I can ask Google Assistant what it, what, what it says and see where it's drawing its sources from. And what I ended up finding out was it was just a top result, but um, there are some some heated sources it turns to. Um, WebMD is a big one, and um, you know when it comes to defining medical information. So the goal here is to try to define it according to a way that would be useful for a, a medical professional, not the general public. And so. Um, Probably what will happen is as we're def as we're building up our our database of terminology, consulting with a physician to review or 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 more than one physician to review the definitions to see how useful they are. 
Okay, we're running short on time here. If you need to go, I mean, uh, but please, uh, you know, I've enjoyed uh, speaking with you all today, and um, I, I hope to be invited back. Um, on the other hand, if you would like to stay and just chat with the bot, um, or if you have some specific questions for me, I'd be happy to answer those as well.